Rainwater Harvesting. Today I'll be sharing with you about rainwater harvesting. Therefore, I'll be sharing with you nothing new. In fact, the practices we'll be exploring have been utilized by people in arid lands all over the world for thousands of years. Why? Because rain is life. It always has been and it always will be. It provides water for our springs, rivers, and aquifers on which we depend on for sources of fresh water. And those sources of fresh water are limited. More than 99% of Earth's water is unusable by humans and other living things. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, less than 3% of Earth's water is fresh water, and most of that 3% is inaccessible. Of the less than 3% fresh water, more than 68% of it is found in ice caps and glaciers. Just over 30% is found in groundwater, and approximately 1.3% is surface and other fresh water, which leaves us with only about well, about 0.3% of Earth's water that is unusable. So when we do get precipitation, it's precious gift. And in the words of Brad Lancaster, author of what is considered the Bible of rainwater harvesting, it's a gift that's ripe for harvesting. So we should harvest the rain. But first, we need to know what it means to harvest the rain. In simple terms, rainwater harvesting is the act of capturing precipitation and using it as close as possible to where it falls. And that is what we'll discuss today. Simple and small scale strategies and principles you can follow to allow rainwater to permeate and enhance your landscapes, gardens, and life. But first, a little bit about my background. I was raised in southeastern Idaho on a dry land farm. No irrigation. The water we relied on to grow our crops was from the moisture stored in the soil after winter snowmelt and rain. So at an early age, I was taught the importance of capturing and utilizing rainwater on site as a beneficial purpose. I moved to Tempe in 1991, and after attending a permaculture design course in 2008, I changed careers. Working for a nonprofit organization, Watershed Management Group, I had the opportunity to teach the importance of water harvesting and implement water harvesting projects through the WMG Phoenix Green Living Co-op. I now continue to share my knowledge of water harvesting through my new role as water program specialist for the city of Tempe. The photo you see is from a co-op workshop where we shape the earth to slow spread and sink the rainwater. And if you haven't already guessed, yep, that's Tina hugging the berm. Well, it's no wonder why some think rain is, problem, is a problem, especially when there's flooding. Our rains can happen really fast and we can receive a large amount in a short time. And then it's gone. Storm drains remove water from our streets to make it safer for our community. But over stormed, but our storm drains are released into lakes and rivers. Many of our valley storm drains direct water to the Salt River or to a natural wash, getting rid of the problem of stormwater on our streets and helping support natural habitats at the same time. You see, storm drains direct storm water straight to streams and rivers and open retention areas while sanitary sewer pipes lead to water treatment plants to be clean. You can see from the graphic on the screen that the storm drain system is completely separated from the sanitary system. And for good reason, we don't want the storm water to overwhelm our wastewater treatment system. But there is a problem. It's often not just rain in our storm drains. On the way to a storm drain, rain can pick up anything we leave on the ground, visible or not. The trash that is picked up sometimes plugs the storm drain inlets, leading to flooding on the streets. Overuse of fertilizers and chemicals can also be picked up by the rain, damaging our natural environment. To sum it up, trees and pervious landscapes used to slow the flow of water and allow water to infiltrate into the soil. When we remove trees and replace with impermeable surfaces, water runoff and flooding increases. Water also moves faster, increasing erosion instead of lingering to provide multiple benefits before joining the surface water sources and pulling in retention areas. The problem doesn't just start in the obvious place, like a parking lot. It starts right in our own homes. Our properties are traditionally designed to encourage water to leave as fast as possible. As a result, other systems in the home suffer as well. What do you, what do you notice about this house? Is this house contributing or taking away from the earth? What would it feel like to live here? As each yard contributes to the problem, 
Each yard is also part of the solution. The wisest designers learn from nature and we can mimic nature in the way that we design our yards. Because we have a lot less porous land to work with, we must make the land we do have count. By making subtle tweaks and adjustments to the contour of our landscapes, we can be begin to harvest the rainwater and create an outdoor oasis without being a drain on our planet's resources. So ask yourself, would you rather your home be a dirty drain or a delicious sponge cake? All kidding aside, rainwater harvesting is about more than water. It's about turning your home into a vibrant place that contributes to the local environment and gives back to your family and community. And if that sales pitch is not enough, there are also other benefits to rainwater harvesting considered. The water delivered directly from the sky is salt free. That rainwater is naturally distilled and it's, it's got nitrogen, which is free fertilizer that triggers greening of our plants. It's slightly acidic, which helps balance the basic pH of our alkaline soils. The rainwater is soft due to the lack of the calcium carbonate and the magnesium, and it's free. So this is a perfect source we should be using to help water our landscapes. Rainwater harvesting when paired with the desert friendly plants also helps us to decrease the use of precious drinking water in the landscape. Currently in the valley, about half and up to 70% of household water is used in our landscapes. This water comes straight from the tap and contains precious drinking water that has been treated to ensure it is safe for human consumption. Each drop of fresh drinking water goes through the basic water treatment process and then travels through hundreds of miles of water distribution system where it is tested at multiple points. In addition, much of this water originally either came from a river, which means it traveled a long distance, through canals to get to the water treatment plant, or from precious groundwater aquifers, which take decades to regenerate. The water that comes out of the tap is a high quality and meets all safety standards for drinking water. As you've seen from the previous slides, this is done through a complex water treatment process. I'm grateful for drinking water every day, and it's wonderful we have the option to use it to supplement our earth-friendly landscapes, but the most earth-friendly landscapes only needs drinking water as a supplemental watering source, taking advantage of water that precipitates right on site. In summary, these are the reasons why we harvest the rainwater. Now, I know you're wondering, how do we get started? Well, the best way to get started is to start with principles. Brad Lancaster, who wrote Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond, he started with creating eight simple principles. And we have these principles to follow, and we should follow these principles when we take on any water harvesting project. So let's focus on them. One, begin with long and thoughtful observation. Two, start at the top of your watershed and work your way down. Three, start small and simple. Four, plant the rain, slow, spread and sink. The flow of water, now that's important. We really want that, that rainwater to infiltrate into our soils. Always plan for an overflow route and manage that overflow as a resource. Maximize living and organic ground cover. Maximize beneficial relationships and efficiencies by stacking functions. And then we're going to end where we started, observation. Continually reassess your system. It's the feedback loop, and that's really important. So that way you know the things that you're implementing, are they working? Or do they need some, a little bit of tweaking to get them to work the way that, that, that they need to, to be working? So by following these eight simple principles, we can get started with water harvesting in our own yard. And so we're going to start with observation instead of making those changes to the yard that, um, well, we might want to get right into designing, but this is all about observation. An observation is best over several small sessions scheduled at different times during the day. On the screen are some aspects that you should observe during your sessions. There are more to look at, but first let's talk about where you can record these observations so they can be used later. very helpful to create a base map of your property on which you can mark water flow and other observation over time. Be sure to take photos as well. 
bringing a base map to scale can be very easy with today's technology. Simply pull up your property using the Maricopa County's Assessor's Office Parcel Viewer Map. First, navigate to the URL shown on the screen. Then click the acknowledgement that pops up and then click OK to continue. Once you're in the map, there are a few customizations to the map that you can make. First, click on the icon on the upper left hand corner that looks like a sheet of paper layered. A list of layers appear. Simply uncheck any layers that you don't want to see or check any layers that you would like. Then enter the address to your home in the address or intersection box. Before zooming into the map, it may help to turn on satellite imagery. Click on the icon on the upper left hand corner that is square with four squares inside of it with a red background. Note, you have many choices. If you're creating a map for today, it might seem logical to choose the current year, but explore some of the others. Occasionally, the imagery from another year might be clearer. Depending on the time of the day or the time of the year, the imagery was captured. Additionally, if you have any large trees, selecting imagery from a year when your tree canopy was smaller might help you capture more of your landscape's features. Zoom into the map to pull up your property. You'll be able to screenshot just what you want to include in your base map. Additionally, there's a scale bar available on the lower left-hand corner that shows the current scale. It's important to capture that scale within the image so when you print it out, you have a reference. For maps in most recent years, the scale is it's 20 feet. Older maps, the smallest scale is 40 feet. Most operating systems have free screenshot tools that allow you to capture a whole screen or a small screen of this or a small section of the screen. This screenshot shows the property as it was in 2012. The next step is to print out the screenshot as large as you can on a piece of paper. Lay tracing paper over it and trace the basic lines of your home, hardscape, the shed, and the carport, for example. Note down all the existing structures. Continue to add to the base drawing as you walk the yard. It can be helpful to make different sets of observations on separate sheets of tracing paper, so you can mimic what the Maricopa County map does. And then you can add and remove layers as needed, depending on what you want to see will help the clarity of your, of your drawing as well. One layer should include the essential elements. It's important here to resist the urge. As I mentioned before, this is not the time to dream. This is the time to mark down all the elements that you're observing in the landscape. So remember, the first principle is all about observation. Another layer to add consists of utility and irrigation lines. You'll see red is electric, yellow is gas, orange is communication, green is sewer, blue is water. You're going to want to call Arizona 811. It's a free service. They'll mark all the public utilities up to the connection point. And keep in mind the water service line and the sewer line is considered private utilities. So from the water meter to your house is a private utility. Your sewer line from the house out to where it connects to the main sewer line is a private utility. So you would need to hire a private utility locator, or if you need to have any plumbing work, you can hire a plumber to locate those two lines for you. That'd be stacking those functions. It's also good to note where your irrigation lines in your landscape are located and mark them on the base map. Add layers that address the external elements that impact your home, and these are important. Think of your elements. These are things that you, you're not able to change. These are those wild energies that are flowing through your property. So consider the sun, the wind, community, you know, traffic. Where are your view angles? And note those on separate sheets or add them to your base map. Add a layer that identifies how water moves in your home watershed. You'll need to also identify the high and low points of your landscape. How do you find the high and low points? Observe the tracks that water leaves in the soil. You can also watch during a rainstorm and observe where the water goes. 
Those are good observation techniques, but for a good measure, you should identify changes in elevation with a tool called a bunyip. I'll show you what a bunyip is and how to use it later when we talk about planning for overflow. A watershed is an area of land that drains to a common low point. Now you've identified the high and low points in your home watersheds, as well as identified the flow of water through your landscape, the easiest way to start is to start small and simple with earthworks and to start at the top of your watershed. Any changes you'll make will impact the flow of water lower on the watershed. So this is especially important for being able to add features later without having to undo your initial work. But how do you start small and simple when there's so much you want to do? This is where the time you took to observe will pay off. Consider your observation along with the priorities you have for your landscape. On the screen are several examples of different priorities. For example, household, the biggest priority is shade, and second priority is utilizing native snow and plants whenever possible. Returning to our observation made it easy to see what to do first. There are no, there, there are two hot spots that could be addressed with the shade and plant life. These are two areas that just happen to be close to the house. A third problem, not necessarily a priority, but an annoyance is the desire for privacy and noise control from the street. Search through the various plant lists. One example is the landscape plants for the Arizona Desert Guide, which is also online, and find the trees and shrubs with the right characteristics needed to address these priorities and problems. But before planting them, you first need to do you first need to follow the next rainwater harvesting principle, which is to plant the rain. This involves looking at the base map you created, identifying the current flow of water, adding the plants you'd like to grow or existing plants you'd like to enhance, and then identifying how you'd like to change the flow of water to encourage water to slow, spread, and sink into the soil to support your plants. In the backyard, for example, the water is already flowing in the right location. So the focus will be on slowing the movement of water and increasing the infiltration capacity of that soil. In the front yard, the water moves very quickly to the street in a straight line. We'll need to tweak that flow so it takes longer, you know, a longer pathway to the street, if it ever even makes it there. So spreading it over the landscape, slowing it down, is going to definitely benefit as the water has the chance to slowly go into the soil as it moves. Depending on the pathway of the water, the slope of your landscape and where water falls off your roof or other impermeable structures, this, then select the appropriate rainwater harvesting techniques and strategies that can help slow, spread, and sink the water. The drawing is showing simple infiltration basins and burns and, and in Berman Basin pairings that when it rains, the water will passively flow from the roof into the earthworks. Once you plant the rain, you can then plant the trees and other plants. Of course, existing plants can always benefit from the features that you install. Next, I'm going to show some images that bring to life the plants on paper. First, on the screen, you'll see the satellite imagery over several years. This is the front yard in 2012. As you can notice it's, it's fairly flat. It is draining from the, the house to the street. Here's the landscape in 2014 after the addition of berms and basins to help slow and spread and sink the water. Organic mulch has been added and the native and snoring plants. Here's the landscape in 2020. These plants have been primarily rainwatered for the last five years. The water flow in the backyard was already very naturally encouraging the infiltration of rainwater with the one existing tree taking advantage of the natural pooling. Later in 2017, the water harvesting potential was increased by contouring into the landscape some infiltration basins in the drip zone of the tree. If you take in a landscape watering class, you'll know that the drip line is at the edge of the canopy of the tree. If you missed it, it was recorded and you can find it on our website. 
Organic mulch and a few other ground cover plants were added to encourage water to soak and sink. Important changes as the water needs of the Palo Verde continue to increase over time. We want to keep that in mind. As we plant our small young plants, the water requirement is less, but as they grow, their water requirements will increase. Here are a few other shots of the front yard in April 2020. What you're looking at there, that's the, uh, the woolly butterfly bush and the marigolds with some rosemary in the background. We also have chuparosa and jojoba, creosote. And once all these plants get established, they do very well on our rainfall with maybe just a little bit of supplemental water if our, our rain monsoon rains are, are late. Here's the before in the backyard, just starting out with shaping the basins. And then the after with the organic mulch and the organic ground cover. Creating that sponge. Now let's transition to one of the most important principles of rainwater harvesting. You always have to plan for that overflow. You may think, oh, this feature is never going to overflow, but you have to plan for it because it will overflow at some point. So this means you need to design your basins so when they fill up, you know exactly where the water is going to go. Direct the overflow so the water can continue to be a beneficial resource and not destructive. A bunyip can help carefully plan for overflow so you know exactly where the low points are in your rain garden. Remember, gravity works and will take water to the low point. If you want the low point to be another rainwater harvesting feature or the street or storm drain. You don't want that low point to be your home. The water level, also known as a bunyip, is easy to make at home, and two people can use it to measure elevation changes. To build one, you need to gather two straight, two straight stakes about five to six feet in length, a clear vinyl tube about 30 feet, a tape measure, permanent marker, some zip ties. As you can see from the illustration, you want to mark the measurement starting with one at the top with the incremental marks going down the stick. A good way to start is to use the tape measure and measure from the bottom of the stick to 36 inches. Make your first mark and label it one. Then mark every half and one inch going down the stick and numbering them accordingly. If constructed as described, the higher level will be the higher point number with the lower level being the lower point number. In the illustration, it shows the higher level being 16 with the lower level being 14, which means the elevation difference is two inches from the high point to the low point. If you have a distance longer than the bunya pose, use the leapfrog method and keep track of the plus and minus elevation changes on the way to calculate the final elevation difference. The key is to direct and control overflow where you want water to go. Because if you do not, Mother Nature definitely has a plan for that overflow. So you want to make sure that you have it within your design and that the overflow directs that water to where you want it to go. Maximizing that living and organic ground cover. Brad Lancaster calls mulch the spongy welcome mat that lures water into the soil while providing a shelter against evaporation. I think that sums up mulch and the benefits of mulch very well. If you aim to turn your landscape into a sponge, what better way to start than to add mulch, especially some kind of organic mulch, which will break down and give life and fertility back to your soil. If you're not a fan of the look, consider adding it just to the basin bottoms. Mulch made of organic material, such as compost, wood chips, or straw, may also pair better visually with the natural free mulch provided by your plants. If you're able to, consider leaving that free mulch where it falls so it can break down and benefit your soil and plants as well. But you can see from the photo, no need to remove that natural mulch created by the tree, just leave it be. You may purchase bulk mulch mulch. It has more of a uniform look to it, or you may be able to reach out to a tree trimming company to save them the cost of disposing of the mulch, 
while scoring some free material. You can also get a truckload of compost from Tempe's compost inert facility. For free, if you if for residents, uh, there is a small charge uh, for the number two compost. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, small charge for the number one compost, uh, free for the number two compost. And if you don't live in Tempe, there is also a, just a small charge. But you can visit the Tempe.gov and then enter Tempe Compost Yard in the search bar to find the latest information on operating hours, availability, and cost. Maximize and stack the benefits and function of every feature. This is important. Can you build a swell that directs water into a water collecting basin that supports butterfly attracting native plants that attract to act as a windbreaker while also shading and, and creating a seating area? Well, definitely, yes, you can. For example, the benefits from one tree is amazing. It doesn't simply just provide shade, privacy, food, it also cleans our air. Principle eight, continue to reassess your system, the feedback loop, which takes us back to observation. You made to reinforce your spillways, rake after a storm, maintain burns and swells, and caring for plants. This is a good time to get out into the landscape and see how your system is performing. Rainwater harvesting techniques. So let's get into how we would create some of these water harvesting features. So to understand rainwater harvesting techniques the best, it's good to have an understanding that we live on a watershed. A watershed is simply defined as an area of land that drains to a common low point. Mountains from the edge, mountains form the edge of the watershed, directing water into one land area versus another land area. Here's another view of the watershed. Most of the precipitation occurs at the high points at, at the boundaries and then comes in the form of snow. Solar energy causes the snowpack to melt. Gravity pushes the liquid down and down, seeking out the lower points carved by water molecules and wind over time. Some infiltrating through cracks to join aquifers, others joining creeks that lead to tributaries that feed main river stream, steam, main river stems. Watersheds can be considered at different scales. We live, for example, in the Colorado River Basin, which spans seven states and two countries. The colored area in the land area is representing the land area and the edges represent mountain peaks that divide water into our land versus other watersheds. The lowest points are identified by the blue lines, representing water pooling in rivers and lakes that run through the land. We're also part of the Salt River watershed, which spans 13,000 miles as the health of the land determine the health of the water. So the land in this watershed is incredibly important to many of us living in the valley. Over 100 years ago, our forefathers and foremothers protected land within this watershed by making them national forests. Residential properties can also be seen through the lens of a watershed. How many watersheds can be found on this residential private property? And what would you and what would be the edge of each watershed? There are two watersheds on this property with the roof as the boundary. In fact, if you walked on this roof, you would see the roof pitch directs water either to the backyard watershed or to the front yard watershed. Let's return to the general definition of rainwater harvesting, living on a watershed. This means creating sponges in key areas near high precipitation points to slow spread and infiltrate precipitation. Now let's make this definition more specific for the urban environment. In the urban environment, rainwater harvesting involves collecting the runoff from the roof of a house or other impervial surfaces and, dire and directing it for beneficial use, either right in the soil or into a container for later use, as close as possible to the source. So we're directing it for beneficial use as close as possible to the source. There are two types of rainwater harvesting systems that you can use. This presentation focuses on passive. passive. Passive systems require little or no effort after the system is constructed. 
does require heavy front end work, but once implemented, it just works. Examples include berms and basins and swells. Active systems require you to do something to activate the water for beneficial use. Examples include barrels, cisterns, gray water systems. Earthworks, also known as rain gardens, are shaped that we can form in the soil that slow spread and sink water for beneficial use right in the landscape. By creating cup-like or bowl-like shapes into the soil, we're able to create nets for water that work whether you are there or not, hence the passive nature. When paired with trees and plants that are well placed for other functions, Earthworks directs and sinks the water for immediate beneficial use by the plant roots. Earthworks also help increase the quality of water within the watershed, helping it move slowly through our land, reducing erosion and stormwater pollution, providing an environmental benefit. Finally, a well-designed landscape that integrates earthworks enables you to enjoy shade, food, and beautiful in a beautiful oasis that all thrives because of the harvested water. So Joanne Toms, conservation manager with the city of, of Glendale, demonstrates very well the difference that earthworks can make in a landscape, turning it from a drain into a natural storage tank. Tina, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and play the video. This landscape had mounds. And what happens is that when it rains, the mounds just allow that rainwater, that wonderful, valuable rainwater, just, just flow off the landscape. And we don't want that. We want to actually harvest that rainwater. So now we have a series of basins that just collects that wonderful free rainwater. It's free, it's fresh, and it's filling for the landscape. So this will save people, if they do the... Thank you, Tina, for sharing that video. And as you can see, as, as Joanne demonstrated, it's important that we create those cup or bowl shaped like features in the soil so that way water can slow, spread and sink. Which is earthworks and earthworks simply work. They are the foundation of a sustainable landscape because they don't just slow, spread and sink rain, but they can be used to harvest and capture other types of water too. For example, water stored in a cistern, Gray water for, from a laundry, gray water from a laundry or shower, AC condensate, pool drainage water, municipal water through drip sprinklers or bubblers, or even a splash pad runoff. Rainwater harvesting can eventually be the primary source of water for your desert adapted trees, but until those trees are established, those same earthwork features can make your supplemental watering with a soaker hose or a drip system even more effective reducing runoff and giving the soil a chance to accept and sink the water. Here are a few earthwork strategies we'll discuss. We already covered organic mulch, so remember, mulch is like the icing on the cake and is the perfect thing to spread over your earthworks. A berm and basin is the classic earthwork strategy that always comes in a pair. They work best on sloped land with a ratio of three to one, which means a horizontal run of three and a rise of one. The berm is set perpendicular to the slope and can be made using soil that you dig out to form the adjacent basin. If you have existing plants and you want to be cautious of the roots, you can go ahead and dig a shallower basin and then bring in soil to build the berm. Identifying the steepness of a slope can help guide you in the selection of earthwork features. It can also help you implement features appropriately. An easy way to measure slope is to identify the ratio of the horizontal distance as compared to the vertical distance. Also known as a bioswell, the earthwork features is similar to a berm and basin, except that it is curvy and slightly off contour, slows and spreads the water while it moves into another location. And here's another view of the same rain garden, except in the picture, you can see the water actively flowing, collecting off the sidewalk and then entering the swell to be directed through the landscape. If you can't tell of that, if you can't tell all that from the picture, I have a video that captures this pathway for the water. So when watching the video, it shows the water that runs off the roof. It hits the impervial concrete and then flows into the swell to eventually settle into a basin. Take notice that the water is 
barely moving, but it's moving slowly enough that it has a chance to sink along its pathway, feeding plants along the way. That's the magic of earthworks features that slow spread sink water. Also take notice that the cacti are located on the raised part of the berm and not in the bottom of the basin. As you can see, infiltration basins and shallow depressions dug into the earth, they can work on flat to gentle slope land, and they have a level bottom to the, that encourage water to enter and infiltrate into the basin. And so that's important. We want the, the water to, to level out in the bottom of the basin so it can sink into the soil evenly. And the image on the left is taken while doing the final shaping of the basin after planting the trees. The image on the right is from the same day after shaping the basin was complete. A layer of organic mulch was added to increase the sponge-like ability and protect the soil moisture. Infiltration basins are often located adjacent to sidewalks or other pathways, and water can enter from multiple directions. And here is another video that's showing some basins at the Glendale Community Center North. Tina, if you could go ahead and share that video, please. So as you can see from the videos and from the previous photos, we've looked at swells that will help convey rainwater from one location to another. We've looked at infiltration basins, which is those low areas, the, the bowl-shaped, cup-shaped like depressions that where the water is going to, to sink. Another feature that you can install is called the French drain. The French drain is simple, simply a trench or basin filled with angular-shaped crushed rock material that easily conveys water. The benefit to using a French drain is that it quickly removes water from the area. And only use a French drain on flat to gentle slope land and only use with relatively clean runoff water, free from sediments. You know, an example would be water that falls off of a roof. Notice in this picture, the French drain is an excellent solution for the illustration of a small yard. The water falls off the roof and hits a concrete patio. The soil in the front of it is too small to create a basin of much use, so it's important that the water doesn't pull there as it could potentially impact the sidewalk or, or overflow into the street and not be harvested. So the French drain, in this case, quickly removes it from the front of the patio and directs it to an infiltration basin supporting a nearby tree which is hopefully placed effectively to create shade for the home or the patio. 
Here's another example of the French drain capturing runoff from the roof directed to the drains from a gutter and downspout system. I love this example of a French drain. It's a good solution for directing the surface runoff from a concrete driveway to the landscape where the rainwater can be utilized. Another strategy is to reduce impermeable hardscape such as concrete and replace it with whatever possible with permeable options. So reduce those impermeables and replace them with permeable options such as rock gravel, pavers, flagstones, or even salvaged concrete. The reason in the, in the matter is you know, to, to do this is we're always trying to slow it, spread it, and seek it. So by removing that or reducing the impermeable hardscape and replacing it with other solutions, we can, we can do that. Bye. No rain garden is complete without plants. And while any kind of plants benefit, desert adapted and native plants are the best pair for rain gardens that require little to no maintenance or supplemental water once those plants are established. There are over 200 desert adapted plants to choose from. Visit the amwa.org plants to find the perfect plants for your landscape. That's at amwa.org forward slash plants. Any Tempe residents planning on adding desert adapted plants to their landscape can take advantage of the tree bait, rebate every fiscal year, which starts in July. And this is for any desert adapted plants, not just for trees. So remember, that's the city of Tempe tree bait every fiscal year starting July. When implementing any earthworks, keep in mind a couple of warnings. Never infiltrate water in the soil within 10 feet of a building's foundation and always check the underground utility lines. Simply call Arizona 811 to have the lines marked from the street to the meter. This is a free service and they are usually very responsive. You can also go online and request the service. Oh, and don't forget to look up. You won't hit an overhead power line when digging your earthworks, but you don't want to plant the right tree in the wrong place. When implementing rainwater harvesting features, always follow the eight rainwater harvesting principles, which we covered earlier, and make sure water is drained within 12 hours, ideally one hour. You may want to run a soil drainage and percolation test to see how quickly your soil infiltrates water, just to identify if you have any unusual slow draining soil. A simple internet search will reveal many different methods of running this test that range from highly technical or more simplified methods like the one described on the slide. There's even a technique laid out in volume two of rainwater harvesting for dry lands and beyond that helps you identify the infiltration rate by inches per minute. And Art Ludwig's Create an Oasis with Gray Water even details what size of basin you should have depending on your infiltration rate. Of course, the rainwater harvesting best practices we've described so far are designed to help increase your soil's ability to absorb water and prevent problems like the one captured in the picture on the slide, showing a retention area that holds onto water for days after a big rainstorm. However, if your soil is very slow draining, you may need to take additional measures, such as amending it, breaking it up, and using only very shallow and wide shaped earthworks. And in summary, our status quo is to contribute to the problem. Water flows away from the home, losing its potential to benefit our homes and landscapes and getting more polluted. Or you can be part of the solution by making some changes to your landscapes, planning the rain, and strategically adding plants that can enhance the urban forestry, providing passive cooling, and create an oasis for you to enjoy. Turning your home into a sponge also helps to manage stormwater by reducing the amount of flow that runs down or our impermeable streets, which in turn means less stormwater pollution. When paired with efficient supplemental watering and appropriate plant selection, it can even help us definitely use water more wisely. Take advantage of the rain. 
By getting started today, you can turn your home into a sponge that produces and regenerates rather than just takes. And like so many things in life, by giving more, you get more in return. Thank you.